All right, so this is surveying at CEM 263. Um, you know, we got the syllabus here. Um, I'll just touch on the high points of it. Um, so this is CEM 263. So this class works for construction engineering management at OSU. It works for the civil engineering technology program at OSU. It, it does not work for civil engineering at OSU. Okay, civil engineers have a junior level surveying class they take. But construction engineering management, this this will match the class at OSU. Okay. Um, all right. Um, you got my name and uh, phone number there, and office and all that. Office is on this floor of this building. My email, office hours, and all that. We'll be here uh, Tuesday. Generally, we'll have class from two to four, and then Thursday we go outside and do labs. Okay. So remember that on Thursday we'll be outside. So just come dressed for whatever the weather is. Normally we're under on campus under the decks a little bit, so we don't get rained on quite so much. But uh, you know, windy and cold, and the rain blows in the wind and all that. So you know, just on Thursday, just come for for prepared for weather. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to do in here is we're going to cover theory. We're going to cover how to calculate stuff and field practice. And then we're just going to get outside and we'll do some distance measuring, leveling, traversing, topographic surveying. Um, we're going to use traditional equipment, which is uh, uh, total stations, which have an electronic distance measure and a theodolite, a thing that measures angles, and we'll also use GPS equipment a little bit. Okay. So when we're done here, you should be able to describe the basic theory of, uh, of surveying, describe proper field survey techniques. So I'll ask you about the labs that we've had. Um, I'll ask you to do some calculations. Um, I'll expect you to create professional looking survey notes and I expect you to function effectively on your survey crews. So we'll have you make up crews. So be thinking about that. The crews have uh, three to four people on them. So and then we kind of trade off on the party chiefs. Okay. So everyone will have a chance to be the party chief of a crew kind of run the show so to speak. And then we'll need crews and we need a crew name also. So just, you know, if, if you know some people you like to work with, just make a, a group and a crew and come up with a name. OK. Um, OK, so to be in here, you should have had, hopefully if you've had some right angle trigonometry of some type, you know, where you're comfortable with that. Nothing too major, but just sine and cosine and tangent and stuff like that. We that we use that quite a lot because we, we shoot lines at an angle. We need to convert them into X and Y coordinates. So that's why we use that stuff. OK. Um, and you know, so just be familiar with right angle trig. We, you know, we, we do a fair amount of calculations in here. Nothing really crazy, you know, as far as the difficulty of them, but we do a fair amount of calcs in here, okay? Um, okay, so to be in here, you ought to have the, the workbook, the surveying one workbook, okay? Um, so, I'll grab a bunch of books on the left here today. So what this thing looks like is this. It's a shrink-wrapped book in the bookstore. It's got a picture of an old school surveyor on the front, OK? Um, so OK, so that's you need this, and you want to bring it with you to class. So that's important to bring it with you, OK? Because we work through stuff here in class all the time. So we want to have this with you. It's got the notes. It's got homework. It's got all the, in the labs. It's got all the stuff you need in it, OK? So that's the text for the class. Um, you should have clothing for uh, cold and wet weather. Um, you know, it's probably a good idea if you're going to work in this field to have a survey book. Um, I don't care which one that would be. All the homework and notes and things are in that packet there, okay? But it's a good idea to have some sort of survey book, I think. It is a little bit uh, hard keeping up, you know, with surveying these days. So whatever you have is going to be out of date probably as soon as you buy it. But but all the same, it has good information, and it'd be good to have some sort of text eventually you know, for this class. Okay, but but again, the packet is enough to, to get you through. You don't need to uh, buy any specific book it, as far as a surveying book goes. Okay. Um, okay, so will um, the survey homework will be ten percent, survey labs will be ten percent, and the exams will be eighty percent of your grade. There's two exams: a midterm and a, and a final. Um, Okay, and then the grading is just a straight percentage. It looks like I still have an old grade on the uh, 
syllabus that doesn't belong there. That Y grade we no longer use, so that one's gone. Okay, the Y grade is gone. Um, okay, uh, labs will be graded on attendance, so you got to come to the labs. Accuracy and uh, ability to create professional notes. So that, that's what I'm going to grade you on in the labs. Okay. Um, don't take late homework or labs. Okay, a midterm and a final will be given. To make up an exam, just contact me before the exam and let me know that you can't make it and we'll schedule something. You have to attend at least 80% of the labs and perform the field operations correctly to get a passing grade out of this class, okay? So this class involves coming to the labs and going out and doing them. That, that's a really important part of this class is getting your hands on the equipment and, and doing the labs, okay? Um, Okay, we got a paragraph in there on professionalism and attendance. You know, you can read through that, but just, just show up, keep a good learning atmosphere, show respect for everybody around here, okay? Um, all right, now on the back we've got the schedule, and I'll hold pretty closely to that. I'll assign homework every week and a lab every week. So we got the homework in the lab on the back. I've got a list of uh, expectations of employers, which are pretty good ex expectations here. I've got uh, another paragraph about academic honesty. So, you know, just be sure you're doing your own work. You're certainly welcome to work with your friends as you go through things. But everybody has to turn in their own work and certainly their own exams. So just be aware of that. If there's any problem with that, uh, you know, if there's any cheating on tests, you'll get a zero for that test or, or homework, okay? And also be aware that people who aid other people in cheating uh, will be held responsible as well. So just be aware of the academic honesty thing there. Um, disability services and emergency planning. If you have any sort of accommodations that you need, just let me know and we'll, we'll take care of that. Okay. And we'll, we'll attend to that. And also we have an anti-discrimination statement. So, you know, we don't tolerate discrimination here at Lynn Benton due to any number of factors that are listed there. So, um, you know, I think basically what that boils down to is just treat people here decently, you know. All right, so that's the run through the syllabus there. Are there any uh, any questions on that? Yes. How many midterms? One midterm and then one final. Okay. And I'll, I'll announce those about a week out. Usually the midterm's week six, I think. It takes a while to get through some stuff here. Okay. Other, other questions? Yeah. Did you say there are two uh, no, just uh, there's two total exams, okay. one midterm, one final. Okay. We're good. Uh, anything else? Okay. Uh, let's see here. Okay, who, who doesn't have the notes yet, the packet from the bookstore? And what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you some to keep you going this, uh, this week. With them. So these are the notes. You, you see that um, the deal is 
you know, every week we cover stuff, and I, I don't want you listening to write everything down I say. I want you to listen. So I, I just got these notes for you. But, um, you know, it is sequential, but it jumps.
that were used early on. Um, there's a dumpy level right there on the cover of your book. Um, it's a level with four screws on it and a long brass telescope that's usually nowadays they're parkerized. Um, long telescope on those things. They also had a transit which kind of combined a compass and an angular measuring device with a telescope. Okay, so that was in the 1800s. They also had chains that they used for measuring distances. So pretty good equipment back then. Okay, nowadays it's, it's just really, surveying's become quite high tech. You know, if you go to a surveying convention, you think you're at a Star Wars convention sometimes. A lot of this stuff is laser-based, satellite-based, and based on inertial type uh, theory to get really accurate surveying instruments. I think standard surveying gear um, would be a tape and a level. So a tape is used to measure uh, distances, a level to shoot a flat line and to determine elevations. A theodolite measures angles. An electronics distance measure, measuring device uses a laser that bounces off of a prism to measure distance. A total station combines a theodolite and an EDM, electric dis distance measuring. We'll use a, the a total stations. GPS, which uses signals from satellites to determine position. And now there's also scanners that are getting used more and more, which just shoot out a whole field of laser waves, get the uh, bounce back, and from that can create very accurate models of, of buildings and whatever uh, people are trying to survey. Okay, so that's some of the, you know, some of the equipment that's commonly used these days. Um, and, you know, large companies that have a lot of money can get even more complicated devices. Um, you can combine an ED, uh, a GPS on a van with a, a scanner and make a real-time map of a road if you wish. You know, there's all sorts of technology that's used these days. Okay, so there's a tape. You know, uh, just pull that thing out and measure a distance. There's uh, a level. You shoot the rod there and you can determine elevation space using that. Here's a total station with a prism. And there's a surveying GPS. So a little bit more high powered than the Garmin that you might carry around with you. Okay, a little bigger and, and more accurate set up on a tripod or a staff. Okay. So that's some of the gear that we use. And just a little bit on how things have evolved. Okay. Now the theory of this is you have to start off with a known point in some known direction, okay? And that's, that's called your control. So if you look around, if you're walking around town, sometimes you see these brass caps set in the ground. That, those are control points. They're points of known location. Then you come off of those to set new points with survey equipment. You know, in the old days, all the control was in the ground, set in with brass caps. Nowadays, some of our control is orbiting around the Earth, you know, with our GPS systems and all that. Things change, but some things, the principles stay the same. Okay, then once we have that control, we come off of it. So someone who's skilled at surveying, they, they have to know their math, certainly their geometry and trig, that's important. But they also have to know land law, because it's difficult to recreate boundaries of property. It's not just a, a geometry problem, it's also a legal problem because sometimes boundaries conflict and you have to be able to make a good judgment on where the boundary was originally set. You gotta figure out how to use equipment, often high-tech equipment, and you have to manage people. So those are the things that a surveyor can do well to succeed, okay? Okay, there's a lot, lots of types of surveying. Um, common, there's more than just I'm showing here, but commonly there's land surveying. Okay, land surveyors establish property boundaries. Okay, so they're figuring out where your lot is. This is very high liability business, so they have the highest levels of precision and accuracy in what they do, because they can get sued if they don't get points put in the right spot, and often do, okay? 
So land surveying, land surveyors are, they take their time and they get it right, okay? Construction surveyors, construction stakes, they move faster and they're less precise and accurate. You know, when I did this type of work, when we're, you're putting in a manhole, we used to say, get within a pie plate. You're, you're fine. That's good. Don't waste time and set them more precisely than that, okay? Uh, a land surveyor wants to get within a couple of hundredths for sure. But a, a construction surveyor, you're going to have a lot more room for um, uh, air, okay? You know, I remember a company I worked for, we had a fellow who was a land surveyor, and they tried to get him out there construction surveying. And it didn't work real well because he wanted to check all his angles and take his time and look at everything. And you know, that, that isn't how you construct a survey. Construct a survey, you get the stakes in the ground and you get on down the road because you know, time's money. You know, that's a little different attitude. Okay. All right. And there's also geodetic surveying that considers the curvature of the earth. Okay. It uses a very complex mathematics and often high technology. Okay. So there's a land survey that was submitted to the county. A okay. uh, little bit of drawing of splitting up a lot into two lots, lots of text describing the property, sign-offs from the county and the property owners, a legend, North Arrow, and stuff like that. I don't think you've got a copy of this, but, but you get the idea. It, it's, it's just you're figuring out where to put property corners to determine uh, lots. Okay, So that's land surveying. Land surveyors are licensed by the state and they have to submit a drawing to the county every time they do work that shows where they set their new property corners. Okay, construction surveying uses plans, plan and profile. They go out there and set stakes, or these days they might be more concerned with setting up uh, control because uh, nowadays there's going to be automated equipment out there that runs on its own. So, um, you know, but whatever. Somehow you're going to use these construction plans to set points. Geodetic concerns itself with the curvature of the earth, so it's very large-scale surveying. You know, at some point, somebody had to coherently survey a road that started up, what, Blaine, Washington, and went down to whatever the very south of California is, I-5, right? Somebody had to survey that thing piece by piece, so that, that involved the curvature of the earth. If I'm just out here doing a little project, I don't care about the curvature of the earth. It's not big enough to bother me. But if I'm building I-5, I'm going to start thinking about that, okay? So that's geodetic survey. Okay. Okay, now, if you really are interested in surveying, your goal should be to become a registered land surveyor, sometimes called a professional land surveyor, so an RLS or a PLS. This is licensed by a state board, <coughs> Osbeals it's called. You've got to have education. You've got to pass the land surveyor and training test. You have to have probably four or five years of experience and have people sign off on that, then pass the state exam. And you can become a registered land surveyor. Okay. Um, you could do that and get the education through Oregon State if you major in civil or construction engineering plus take a certain number of credits of surveying classes. I think it's, I can't remember, 16 kind of sticks in my mind, but I'm not 100% on that. But So, you know, you can do that through OSU. You also could go to Oregon Institute of Technology, OIT. They have a surveying program there. All right. So to set a property corner in the state of Oregon, you've got to be a registered land surveyor in the state of Oregon. You have a stamp that you have, and you stamp your drawings. Okay, because it's a legal matter to do this type of surveying here, to, to split this big five acre lot into two and a two and a half acre lots. Someone had to figure out where to put those markers to set that line. That person had to be a registered land surveyor. When they did it, they had to turn in a copy of a map showing what they did to the county, and that map had to be stamped with their current survey <coughs> stamp. Okay? It's a legal document. Now, anybody, can, can do construction surveying. You can start your own construction surveying business today if you wanted, but you can't do land surveying unless you're a professional land surveyor, okay? So that's kind of the, the deal because the land surveying is, is a legal issue, okay? Because you're, you're determining where people's property is. So everybody okay with that?
Doing all right? Okay. All right. Okay, now when we survey, um, we are very, very particular about how we take measurements and how we report them. Okay, in this country, we still use feet to measure our distances. Just about everywhere else in the world, they use meters, but we use feet. Now, we don't, do not use feet in inches, though. We use decimal feet, okay? So I don't want to hear the word inch in this class. It really is not relevant to anything we do in this class, the word inch, okay? We use feet and decimal feet. So we don't measure in feet and inches. We measure in feet and tenths and feet and hundredths. So notice this surveying rod, okay? There's four feet, there's five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Not twelve, ten. Okay? Just be aware of that. Okay? So we use feet and tenths. Now let's see why we do that. Let's add these numbers. How many uh, feet and inches do we got over there on the left? Yeah, how about how about in feet and inches? What do we got? What do we have to do here? Because we measure in, in eighths and sixteenths for inches, don't we? So what? Five eighths would be ten sixteenths, right? Ten sixteenths and nine sixteenths gets you nineteen sixteenths. Eight and seven gets you fifteen. Thirty seven and twenty four gets you what? Sixty one? So we gotta carry sixty you with me how this is not going very efficiently. So I'm getting 62 feet, 4 and 3 16 inches, I think is what I'm getting out of that. All right. But it's so much easier to just add decimals, isn't it? 5, 3, carry the 1, 2, 62.35. Done. Okay. So carp <coughs> carpet, you know, feet and inches are for architects and carpenters. They're not for surveyors. We, we, we go decimal feet. Okay. Period. So there's some of our equipment calibrated in tenths, not, not feet and inches, but feet and tenths and hundreds of feet, okay? So just be aware of that. Now the uh, angular units are in degrees, minutes, and seconds, which is a very old uh, measuring system. It goes way back to uh, Sumeria, way, way back, okay? When they divided things into 60s. And that's used in our time system, isn't it? Okay, an hour is 60 minutes, a minute is 60 seconds. Same thing here, we have a circle, which is 360 degrees. A degree is broken up into 60 minutes. So one degree is 60 minutes, a minute is designated with a tick. A minute is then broken up into 60 seconds. So we call out our angles like 38 degrees, Seven minutes, 15 seconds. That's how we call them out. Kind of an awkward system, but it's an old system that's been used for many years, okay? A second is a very, very, very small angular measurement. If you shoot a line that's four miles long, and you mark a point, and you turn one second of angle, you're one inch over. Okay, that's how small a second is. So that's plenty accurate to do the work we need to do. Okay. So that's one sec. So one inch gets us one second of angle. Okay. Now that's a little awkward doing the math. So I don't know what, what's forty-one point five degrees. What would that be in minute in degrees and second and minutes? Um, let's see. We got forty-one degrees. 0.5 degrees would be how many minutes? Yeah, it'd be 30, okay? One degree is 60, so half a degree is 30. 86.25 is 86 degrees. And then what? what's a quarter of a degree in minutes? 15. 
22 degrees 30 minutes would be 22.5 degrees. Okay. So that's the system for measuring angles. A little bit awkward, but that's that's what it is. Y'all okay with that? All right, we good. All right. Now, if you all take in chemistry or something like that, they probably talk to you about rounding numbers and significant figures and all that. We actually use that in surveying, not quite in the way you learn it in science, but we use similar ideas, okay? The first thing is we round numbers. We don't truncate numbers. And people will get upset about this in, in industry. I've had people get in my face about this before, okay? When I was working and not working in a laboratory or in a university working for just a regular surveying company doing construction work. Okay? And okay. So we, we round, we don't truncate. Truncate is cutting numbers off. Rounding is rounding up or down to the appropriate number. Okay. So if you round 67.427 to the hundredth of a foot, what are you going to get out of that? So what you want to do, you want to mark what you're rounding to, the hundredth of a foot is there. Look at the digit after that. If it's five or greater, round up. Five, less than five, round down. So that's uh, greater, isn't it? 67.43, good with that. Now, do you all know what I mean by truncating? Truncating means just cut off the last number. That would be 67.42, that's wrong, okay? In this class, that, that'll be wrong to do that. All right, how about 41.283? That'll round down to the hundredth, right? Eighty-one point two five eight. Eight greater than five, five or greater, so that goes up. Twenty-four point nine two four goes down. Okay. Good with that? Now, uh, importantly about significant figures is only report what you measure, okay? These, are di these mean different things. So pay attention to this. Those are different things. That means I measured it to the nearest tenth, and it's 92.5. This means I measured it to the nearest hundredth, and it's 92.50. And to a surveyor, those mean different things. And they'll get, again, I've had people upset at me over stuff like that, not people in industry. Because in the back of a surveyor's mind is, I don't want to get sued. <laughs> so they, they do things so they don't get sued. So they don't want to get into trouble on that. You, you all understand the difference there? It, it has to do with how accurately they tried to measure, make the measurement. And they take this stuff seriously. Okay? So figure out what you're measuring to and write it down that way. And I'll, I'll keep an eye on this and mark, you know, and I'll, I'll be looking for this on the work that you do because it's important. Okay? So when I'm doing calcs, I carry all my digits through, I round when I'm done. Okay? Now here's something I ran into when I was working. We had two measurements on the same line. We had 64.8 and 64.5. And I needed to come up with the average distance. So what's the average distance between those two?
What do we got for the average distance? Right. Yeah, okay, here we go. That's what comes out of the calculator, right? And that's what I wrote down when I averaged them. Boss didn't like that. <laughs> we didn't measure that to the hundredth. Measured it to the tenth. That's what he told me. So what I should have wrote down was this. Yeah. Okay? And again, he took that very seriously. He was extremely unhappy that I did that. You all good with what, what my point here? Okay. Okay. So how you write the number down, you're, you're telling people how you measured it is what you're doing. Okay. So any questions on, on that bit? Uh, what we're doing? Okay. Let's see. Uh, okay, so that's just a little bit there on uh, how you report your answers and how you write things down. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we take a break here for about five minutes? I usually like to do that in the middle of the class. It's two hours. It's a bit long to be just going through stuff. So why don't we just take a break here for a minute? Okay. <coughs>